So welcome to the presentation today, Network Like a Pro, Valuable Tips for All Personality Styles. My name is Karen Larson and I work for DPI, Discovery Partners Institute, which is a division of the University of Illinois system. DPI is one of two partner organizations working on Tech Ready Illinois, which is hosting the webinar today. Before we get into the main portion of the webinar, let me tell you just a little bit about Tech Ready. The Tech Ready, as I mentioned, is a uh, joint uh, activity between DPI and P33, two Chicagoland organizations. DPI empowers people to jumpstart their careers or companies in Chicago, and we do three things. We work on tech talent development for high demand jobs. We also work on applied research and development, and we work on building Chicago's tech ecosystem. Now, P33 is a privately funded nonprofit focused on driving inclusive global technology and innovation leadership in Chicago. P33 collaborates to address gaps in Chicagoland's tech ecosystem to make us a leading hub in technology. They also work in three areas, commercializing deep technology, building an inclusive workforce, and scaling growth stage startups. So as you can see, there's a nice overlap between these two organizations. So what is Tech Ready Illinois? Uh, DPI had planned to launch their workforce development initiative later in 2021. And then COVID-19 came along and of course everything blew up. With soaring unemployment in the state and across the country, we knew that we needed to launch our initiative yesterday. We partnered with P33 and brought Tech Ready to light very quickly. So Tech Ready is, is working uh, in a few areas. Uh, we're working to train high demand tech fields, so um, programs around high demand tech fields. Most of the programs we offer include a certificate and some of the programs also include a student experience, which is part includes study groups, coaching and projects. And we've curated the programs with leading employer uh, driven input. We've grouped the programs into four different tracks, data analytics, cloud computing, software development and cybersecurity. We have 10 providers that we're working with delivering over 20 different programs that include content for all skill levels from introductory to advanced, running from full weekend to 32 weeks of learning and range from free to several thousand dollars. To learn more, please visit us at www.techreadyillinois.com. So now let's get to the subject at hand today. Eric Kersetch is a credited actor on IMDb, an occasional backup singer for Josh Groban, and a two-time Chicago marathoner. He also builds HR community, helps individuals and organizations leverage the DISC personality assessment, and believes in the power of meaningful connection to shape lives and transform careers. Please welcome Eric Kersetch. So we're gonna switch slides here now and and Eric will be sharing his screen now. I will. I'm excited to be here and even more excited to figure out how. OK, I think we got it. I think we got it. Can you see it, Karen, what I'm sharing? I can. I can. Thanks. Excellent. Wonderful. OK, well, I am I am thrilled to be here today. I'm so uh, grateful to Tech Ready Illinois, to Heidi, Chris and Karen, among other people, for inviting me to join you today. Hopefully everybody can uh, hear me well enough. Uh, I know a lot of people have turned off their video, which is absolutely fine with me. I know Zoom burnout is an, is an actual thing. I think it actually helps you practically with your bandwidth as well by turning off video. So all, a number of practical reasons for turning it off. Um, as it so happens, and this is kind of how it goes when you're working from home, I live in the South Loop here in Chicago, about 10 floors above the CTA, and a whole group of people are out there working on the tracks today. So if you hear noises in the background, that is what's going on. But that is not going to keep us from, from going forward and spending uh, the next 54 minutes or so together talking about everybody's favorite topic, professional networking. Um, I say that sort of tongue in cheek, and I don't want to assume that everybody who's joining us today um, dislikes professional networking. Actually, I come across a number of people who say I, I actually very much enjoy it. It's something that I feel like I do well, 
But I would also say, I'd hazard a guess that the vast majority probably of people that I talk to about professional networking are not so sure about it. They, they have something to figure out before it's going to be something that becomes fruitful and enjoyable for them. So I am really interested right off the bat, and Karen, you may have to help me with this or somebody who can pull up the, the poll. Um, we have prepared just a quick poll to engage you right off the bat. And uh, we're gonna ask you a question that says, how would you describe your relationship with professional networking? Professional networking is all about relationships. And so we'll, we'll call it that. You have three options. I love it. It's where I shine. Not my favorite thing to do, but I see why it's valuable. Or finally, just <laughs> simply, no thank you. There's no right or wrong answer. I think they're anonymous. Either way, it's gonna set us up for, for a good conversation today. Um, as you um, chime in, and actually we, we've gotten a number of people already, so uh, I don't know if you can see the results or not. Uh, we might have to end the poll and share the results. And somebody has done that for us. You're going to see 67% of you fall into this category that says, not my favorite thing to do, but I see why it's valuable, which is a fantastic start. We have 27% uh, of you that say, I love it. That's where I shine. I want to make sure in our time together that that 20%, 27% of you doesn't feel like you're being overlooked in any way. A lot of what we share is going to be for the 67% that says, I see valuable value, not my favorite thing to do. And even the 7% that is saying, no, thank you. There are reasons for that, very valid reasons for that, why people might just bow out of professional networking altogether. And the goal, regardless of what bucket you fall into today, our goal is to get to a place where at one o'clock central time, you feel that professional network can be a fruitful, enjoyable experience, and you know how to, to make it so. You understand that you have some agency in this process and you're not a victim of circumstances here that, that you can really do this in a way that's going to be fruitful and enjoyable for you. I wholeheartedly believe it. Um, before we get going and we can we can close the actually maybe I have to close the, the poll on my end and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. Hang with me just a second here. Can you still see I, it because I, I stopped sharing. Yeah, that's okay. I had to close it down on my end, but I had to minimize my screen share to do that. Okay. I want to encourage people to participate. Karen mentioned that we will have time for questions at the end. Uh, maybe we won't. Maybe those questions will come throughout. I would love for people, even if you leave your video off, to, to ask a question when you have one. Um, I'm not able to see everybody myself. Everybody's um, everybody's avatar will say on my screen. So you may just have to unmute yourself and sort of insert yourself into the conversation if you want to ask a question. But I really do want this to be interactive. I'm so used to doing things face to face. And now that everything is virtual and online, I want to make sure that we remain um, meaningfully connected and that there is a, a, a back and forth and a dialogue. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just kind of interrupt me. I won't take it personally and we'll go from there. But right off the bat, we've already thrown out the term networking. We're certainly going to get uh, much farther into this, but I want to have a sense from you what you think networking even means. It doesn't matter what I think it means, and I'm not going to be one of those presenters that starts with a dictionary definition, which you see so often to kind of set the tone for a conversation. None of that matters as far as I'm concerned. What matters is how you define the term networking because you're going to be the one doing it. It has to be for your reasons and for your motivation. So who wants to be bold enough to unmute themselves and and offer their own definition or, or even set of, we'll call them, um, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, uh, benefits, to why we would even network to begin with? Who wants to offer a definition? All you have to do I'll is unmute in. yourself. Heidi, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Great. Um, for me, it's about um, connection and learning. All right. I love it. So right off the bat, two things you offered. Connection, which sort of implies that it's a, it's a dialogue. It's a two-way street, that there are other people involved. 
And then learning, whether it's one way or two way, you are certainly going to leave uh, a networking conversation having learned something about what, Heidi? What could you what could you learn in a networking conversation? Um, a, a range of different things. So, I mean, it's learning about the person I'm connecting with. It's oftentimes learning about their career. Um, it's oftentimes learning about their network. Um, and oftentimes I make connections, um, you know, to others that are secondary to initial conversations that end up being very valuable. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'd love to hear from somebody else. What, what, what does networking mean to you or what could your motivation be for professional networking? Who else wants to contribute? I'd love to hear from at least one other person. Hi, Lotus. Hi, Lotus. Uh, for me, I would say networking is, you know, building really meaningful conversations that, um, you know, the benefit of that is just mutually being able to share with each other, whether that's ideas, stories, um, like Heidi said, things that you can learn from each other, resources, any of the above. I love it. That's fantastic. So you've already hit on a couple of my favorite buzzwords. Uh, buzzwords sort of cheapens them, but my favorite words, and that's meaningful connection. You said meaningful and you use the word connection. And I think that that is often what networking comes down to. But too often, um, we're discounting networking as something that's that's superficial and it's it's uncomfortable and it's uh, very transactional. But when you think of networking as meaningful connection and look at it, begin to change your perspective a little bit. We're going to get into this. Suddenly, it takes on a different life. And I, I really think along the way, we're going to have to come up with a different term because I think networking itself as a term turns people off. Um, but when you think of it as meaningful connection, that you're connecting with people, that you're making friends, that you're really wanting to get to know people for who they are and, and what connections they have and what, what ideas and um, passions and skills and talents that they bring to this relationship that we are forming and the fact that it's going to be a longer term relationship. Now suddenly networking is taking on this real meaningful component. It's not just, okay, I'm here for five minutes or 10 minutes or an hour, and I'm gonna go on my way and we're never gonna meet again. It's, now wait a minute, there might be something more to this. So right off the bat, I wanna challenge everybody to consider what your own definition of networking is and whether that's working for or against you. If you have this internal monologue saying networking is, is superficial and it's transactional and it's, um, it's so surface level and it's not something that I want to do, that is going to determine whether or not this is something that you want to engage with going forward and how you do that when you choose to. If instead you say, well, this, this can be fruitful, it can be enjoyable, I just have to figure out how to make it those things, now suddenly the door blows wide open and allows us to figure out how we can do this more effectively. My um, disclaimer right off the bat, and I'm full of disclaimers for whatever reason, is that even though I get all fired up about this and I speak regularly, including at the, at the SHRM 2019 um, uh, annual conference, the national conference in Las Vegas, I did a, a topic or a session called Network Like an Introvert. I am somebody who identifies as being introverted myself, and so quite honestly and transparently, I'm still figuring this out. So even though I am the featured speaker today, I'm speaking in part because I'm still trying to figure out how I can make networking more fruitful and enjoyable for me. When I go to the grocery store, <laughs> there may be two things on my grocery list, getting eggs and making sure that I don't run into anybody <laughs> that I know, right? So when we start to talk about meaningful connection now, even somebody like me who does speaking on this quite regularly is, is, is uh, at a bit of a disadvantage if in the moment I'm not sure if I know how to connect with people or if I feel comfortable connecting with people. I remember a story that I tell is there was uh, not too long ago, it was a few months ago actually at this point when we were still allowed to go out and about and meet people face to face, I had put on, uh, I, I have this uh, HR mastermind community called HR Hot Seat. And I had I put on this event and I had been connecting with people all day long, 
came home to get my mail and the mail area in our condo is just beyond the passenger elevator. So I went to the mail area, got my mail, and was going to return to the passenger elevator to come up to our condo on the 10th floor. And I heard somebody else come in and press the button before me. And I looked around the corner and it was somebody that I didn't know. Right? And I had a, a decision to make. Do I ride the elevator up with this person and potentially have to make small talk? Uh, or do I stay where I was? I will be honest with you. I hid around the corner until the person that I didn't know had gotten into the elevator <laughs> and gone up to her floor and the elevator could return. I'm saying this to tell you that even though this is something that I get really excited about, that I have learned quite a bit about and am excited to speak about with others, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. And I think in part, this is because I fall into this group of people, 25 to 40% of the population that identifies as, and I've already said it, being um, somewhat introverted. And this may be a term that, that you're familiar with, and we're not gonna focus necessarily on introverts during this conversation today, but I think right off the bat, it's worth talking about because quite often as I'm speaking with other, other introverts, they like me say, you know what? This is just uncomfortable. I'm not sure that I'm doing it right. I'm not sure that I want to do it to begin with. And so I think it, it uh, bears spending some, just at least a little bit of time on right off the bat. So let's talk about the difference between people who identify with being introverted and those with extroverted. And you, you see on your screen um, some of the differences. Introverts, it's quite often said that introverts are, are really getting their energy from, from within, from being introspective, from being alone, from solitude at times. Um, that's how they are recharging. Extroverts, you often hear that they get their energy by being around other people. They get it from their environment and prefer that stimulation. So that's, I think, a very basic difference in, in definition. I would add to that something that I've read about more recently is that there's a, a physiological underpinning to these differences, that even physiologically, introverts are more easily stimulated. And so introverts then are often attempting to avoid that stimulation by being by themselves, by getting out of a noisy room, by seeking quiet so that they can do their best thinking or connect with other people, which they still want to do, one-on-one um, -on -one perhaps. Extroverts are less easily stimulated physiologically, and so they are looking for that stimulation in their environment. So extroverts are often the first to say, I love professional networking because it puts me in a place where I can be in the spotlight, I can be the center of attention, I can connect with people, I can have great conversations and really allow this sort of natural energy and enthusiasm that I bring to life show through. I was listening just, um, my wife and I just got back from a, a 10 day road trip to Yellowstone and Grand Teton and we, got, we showed up at one o'clock last night back at home. And on the way back, we were listening to a phenomenal book. Um, I think it was called Atomic Habits. And you'll have to forgive me because I forget the name of the, the author uh, right now off the top of my head, but I think it was called Atomic Habits. And toward the end of the book, he was talking about personality styles, which of course I perk up being so familiar with the DISC personality style among other things. And he said that even from birth, when babies are born and they're in the hospital and a, and a, a loud noise is played, there are certain babies that will turn away from that loud noise and certain babies that will turn toward it. And as you follow these babies over time, you will find that the majority of the babies who turn away from that loud noise end up demonstrating more introverted tendencies. And the babies who turn toward that loud noise end up demonstrating more extroverted tendencies, which I just was so fascinated by. So even from the very beginning of life, we can get a sense of whether or not we are gonna identify with being more introverted or extroverted over time. Unfortunately, there are a number of misconceptions around introversion. And right off the bat, let's just say that it is not a fear. So introversion is not a fear. It is how we, where we get our energy, how we recharge, but there's nothing abnormal about it. And quite often people say, well, if you're introverted, then, then you are afraid of being around other people. You have some anxiety around that. Or that if you're introverted, it means you're shy. 
it doesn't mean those things at all. And people will often say, well, if you're introverted, that means you don't want to connect with other people, that you have a harder time, that you'd rather, you know, almost kind of sit in a closet by yourself all day. I mean, I've heard so many different things. Turns out that none of that is true. And if you um, are a follower of Susan Cain, who has an immensely popular TED Talk on the topic of introversion, Susan Cain has said in a recent podcast with Adam Grant called Work Life, which is a great podcast if you want to check it out, she said, everybody, whether you're introverted or extroverted, draws energy from other people. So it's not like introverts are sitting by themselves in the corner not wanting to connect. Susan says, there ends up being this idea that introverts are antisocial, and I always say, it's not that, it's just differently social. She goes on to say, I don't think that there's enough time spent talking about what type of interaction and how much. But she says introverts want to connect with, with other people just as much as, as extroverts do. I'm gonna leave it at that in terms of this introversion talk. I could go on all day about it because it certainly defines or helps to define who I feel that I am and how I connect with the world. If you wanna read more about introversion, there are two books that I would highly recommend. One is by Susan Cain called Quiet. And then the second one is one that I read more recently, which is just as enlightening called The Introvert Advantage by Marty Olson Laney. And so um, feel free to take screenshots of this as you go. We can also share afterward uh, via email links to these resources if you would like that, if that would be helpful. But regardless of you're introverted or extroverted, I put out a poll on LinkedIn and other social media um, saying, okay, what words come to mind when you think of professional networking? And these are the responses that I got from people. <laughs> It's awkward, it's anxiety inducing. And then I said, what would you rather, just be creative, what would you rather do than, what would you rather be doing than professional networking? And I got a woman that responded, I'd rather sit in Chicago traffic during rush hour in summer construction when it's raining and the Cubs are playing. And so those of you who are familiar with the city understand what a strong response that is. She would rather be doing these things than than professional networking. Yet, as we heard earlier from Lotus and from Heidi, there's great value in it, especially if we are looking for um, our next opportunity, professional opportunity, if we're just looking to grow our network, if we're looking to connect with others on LinkedIn, if we're looking to learn about um, what opportunities are available, what we are probably uniquely suited for, if we just wanna make friends, there's plenty of value, yet when you ask someone or you take a poll, should I just skip this networking event? A majority says, yes, I should skip it. <laughs> and then the rest of them also say that they should skip it. So we need to figure out what can we do? Um, what's standing in our way? What are the obstacles standing in our way from keeping us from seeing this as a fruitful, uh, fruitful enjoyable way of spending our time? All right. I want to make sure everybody's still with us. I can't see the chat area myself, but if you're still with, with us, put in, uh, put in a number one in the chat area. And Karen's going to let me know if she sees a whole bunch of number ones coming through that chat area. If you're still with us, type in a number one. What do you see, Karen? I see lots of ones, Eric. Lots of ones coming. Well, that's good. I'm glad. Uh, that, that's, that's definitely a good sign. So we're going we're gonna to keep going here. I want to offer a few reasons why I think, or a few obstacles that I see in terms of seeing professional networking as an enjoyable, fruitful experience. Number one, this is often attributed to Albert Einstein. He may or may not have said it, but one of my favorite quotes, everybody is a genius, <clears throat> but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Just a fantastic well, when you think about how we're naturally wired and how we interact with the world and how we see others doing so. If you assume, for example, as an introvert, that extroverts are doing it right, that they seem comfortable, that they are um, in the spotlight and that they seem really uh, naturally inclined toward this high energy conversation and you aren't, that, that you're deficient in some way, that, that you're being judged by expectations that you can't possibly live up to and vice versa. If you're someone who's extroverted and you get so caught up in the energy of a situation and the energy of a conversation that 
maybe you're not listening, listening as attentively or as actively as you can be. And you see someone who looks more like an introvert kind of in the corner, chatting with somebody one by one, having a really deep, meaningful conversation. You may say, well, I'd, I can't do things like that. You know, I, I do things differently. And, and if that is what professional networking is supposed to look like, then maybe I'm missing the boat somehow. So first of all, we have to get out of our own way and understand that the way that we naturally do this is okay and it's good. We'll talk more about that. A second obstacle is I think that we are not entirely in tune with our own natural strengths. I think we're very cognizant of strengths that other people bring to various situations because we see them interacting and we see how they behave and then we, we make our own judgments. But I don't know that we're as introspective enough as we could be about what natural strengths we bring to professional networking opportunities. <clears throat> as Karen mentioned in the very beginning, I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I sort of brand myself as a disc nerd. Uh, I'd have you raise your hands. I wouldn't be able to see you if you did, but um, a number of you might be familiar with the DISC personality assessment because you've taken it with a, a previous employer, maybe your, your current employer, or, or um, maybe just even in an academic setting. But DISC as a common language is something that I use in working with individuals when I'm doing career coaching, working with teams, when I'm consulting with organizations to help them understand what natural strengths and preferences they are bringing to their relationships and to the work that they do. So for example, if I'm working with somebody in a career coaching capacity, we'll have a conversation right off the bat about, what do you value? Look at these words around the disc circle. What, what of these words really pop out to you as something that you prioritize? And someone may say, well, enthusiasm is really a word that resonates with me or accuracy or results. Then we talk about then how do we, how does that define how you build relationships? How does that define the sort of environment that you should be looking for and the sort of company that you should be looking for based on their values and how they align with yours? How can we be introspective about who we are, what our values and preferences and tendencies are so that we are doing work that um, is truly meaningful and rewarding and fulfilling? Well, the same applies for our networking um, that we do. So if we're somebody who's results oriented and we're very direct and decisive and we get down to business, what is that gonna say about our networking style and how we approach networking conversations, whether in person or online, which we're doing much more of these days since um, it's still, that's, I think, largely discouraged that we spend too much time in close proximity. If we're enthusiastic and we show up and we want to do all the talking, what does that say about how we are going to be interacting with other people and the time that we're going to allow for them to tell us about who they are and what they prefer and what they're looking for in a, in a longer term relationship? And so DISC just is one of those things that provides a common language. It's certainly not the only assessment out there. There are, are plenty of others and you don't even need an assessment to be introspective um, about who you are in the strengths that you bring. And I'd love for you to spend just a moment. We'll pause. Perhaps there's going to be a, a, a bit of an awkward silence here. But I would love for you to be, speaking of introspection, I would love to be you to be introspective for a moment, to think about what strengths you bring to a professional networking conversation. It can either be face-to-face, -face, it can be via LinkedIn, it can be online in some way, it can be virtual, it can be video conference. doesn't matter to me what the, the medium is. But just pause for a moment to think about what natural strengths you feel that you bring to a networking conversation. I'm going to give you just a moment and I'm going to ask for somebody to share. While you're thinking about that, I will apologize once again for all of the, the beeping and whatnot you hear below me. They're making great work or making great progress on these CTA tracks. Unfortunately, it's just giving me more background noise than I would prefer. Well, it sounds right. good on my end, Eric. I don't get any extra noise. Oh, good. Fantastic. Well, the, the money spent on a fancy microphone is helping then. 
All right. I would love to hear from somebody that we haven't heard from, and I can, I can call on people if I need to, but what are some strengths that you feel you bring to a professional networking conversation? Who would like to volunteer? Hi, Eric. This is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Good to hear from you. Thanks. This is great. This is lots of great info. Um, I think that what I bring is um, resources um, from the knowledge, you know, that if I know something, um, that I'll, I'll talk about it and help try to help that person. But then vice versa, I think just throughout my journey, um, being laid off recently, mm -hmm. um, I've learned a lot from other people too. Um, and then just the caring of other people as well. Good. So you, you kind of touched on what Heidi said about learning. Yeah. Um, and you're, you use the word resources, but there's learning that goes on there as well. And then caring about other people. So you, it sounds like you really want to get to know people for who they are. You're not there just for a superficial back and forth. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, when I reach out and I'd like to know, learn about these people lifelong and, yeah. you know, build that relationship. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. Let me hear from one more person. What are some unique strengths that you feel you bring to a professional networking conversation? Hi, this is... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, this is Chris. Um, I've been told by others that I'm a good listener. You know, um, so yeah, I, I obviously I identify as an introvert, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a good listener in the sense that I don't say much, but I'm responsive. Yeah, that's wonderful. And we're going to get into that in a moment. That's such a great quality. And you said, obviously, that means I'm an introvert. Let me just clarify that extroverts can also be good listeners, right? These are all skills and strengths that we can build and um, exhibit when we, when we need to and demonstrate when we need to. It, it turns out that people who identify as being on the introverted side of things tend to be good listeners, you know, and ask, ask particularly um, insightful questions and maybe don't want to do as much talking and would rather listen. So I think a lot of introverts have said that it, it probably comes more naturally to them. Um, but the extroverts among us um, are, can also be good listeners. I'd love, let's just throw that in really quick. And I hadn't planned this, planned for this, but I'd love to hear from somebody who identifies as being more of an extrovert, getting their energy from the outside world around them, their environment, who also feels that they are a good listener. Does, does that resonate with any of the extra, extroverts among us? Eric, hi, it's Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, I'm probably a combination of extrovert and introvert, but the way you describe it there of getting energy from the environment is certainly true of me. Yeah. Um, and I started my career as a reporter. And so, as you say, you can build those skills to listen intently to extract information and, you know, give uh, then guided questions that get you what you're after. Yeah. Um, so yeah, certainly a skill that um, I was able to build. Thank you for that. And you, you mentioned something really important. You said I might be a little bit of both and we technically all are, you know, there's this term ambivert out there and, you know, even the, the people who originally coined the terms and, and defined introversion and extroversion said, well, no one is 100% introvert or 100% extrovert. We're all on that spectrum somewhere. So if you say, well, it depends on the situation and sometimes I'm more this and, and more that, that's absolutely right. So uh, regardless of where we are on that spectrum, we can all stand to build some of these skills that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about in a moment. Okay, fantastic. This is a vitally important exercise. So as we're thinking about our own strengths, uh, as much as we will talk about the value of our professional networking conversation not being scripted, I'm a strong believer that you have to start from a very basic script. You have to be so clear on what value you bring, what strengths you bring to a professional networking relationship that you're able to um, spit it out without even thinking about it, have it be so second nature, at least some basic 
um, version of this script. And one formula that I like to offer for what we'll call a value statement, that when someone asks that dreaded question, what do you do, that you start with these four or you narrow it down to these four things. And even the first three are going to be sufficient. Number one, I help whom? Who do you help? And this can be regardless of what you do. You can be employed traditionally. You can be an entrepreneur. You can be somewhere in between. This formula will still apply. Who do you help? What do you help them do? How do you help them do it? And then if you want to throw in this sort of bonus, what is the lasting result? So this is something if you, I would take a screenshot or uh, write, this, write this down, I would love to spend time on it now, but uh, given the, the time that we have left, I wanna make sure we continue. We may be able to come back to this, but I help whom to do what by, you know, uh, what, what method do you use? And then so that they can, what is the lasting result? So an example, just to give you an idea of what that can look like, I've often used this one. I help individuals and teams better understand their own communication and personality styles via one-on-one -on -one coaching and group workshops. So you see what I do and how I do that. And then what's the lasting impact so that they can connect more effectively with others. Does this sound very marketing? Marketing? You know, like it's a marketing language? Yes. Does it sound like something that I copy and pasted from my website? Absolutely. Is this what you're gonna say to somebody? Maybe, maybe not. What's important about this value statement is that you show up with the confidence of what you're bringing to the relationship. And you can riff on this then, you can, you can um, improvise on this because you're so clear about your strengths and about your value. So then when I'm in front of a different audience, I'm gonna change this a little bit. When I know my audience needs something different from me, I'm not gonna push this side of things. I may push a different side. So for example, for the HR Hot Seat Mastermind that I run, if I'm talking with a group of people who might be interested in joining the HR Hot Seat Mastermind, my value statement is gonna look a little bit different, but there's still gonna be common threads. This takes introspection. And guess what? It's never set in stone. Sometimes I attend events or put myself virtually in a place to introduce myself simply for the value of introducing myself. Even if I'm not entirely interested in that particular, particular virtual event, but I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna have the opportunity to make an introduction or to introduce myself, registering for it and introducing myself will allow me to say, okay, does this still fit? What do I need to change about it? What strengths have I been um, honing um, recently that I should be inserting into this value statement. All right. So I, I don't want to spend much more time on this, but even though we're going to move now toward a, something that is less scripted, I think beginning with something that's a little bit more scripted is going to be valuable to us. All right. I'm going to pause long enough to ask if there are any questions. I know we've already covered quite a bit of information. We have about 20 minutes left and I want to ask if there are any questions or Karen, if you've seen any questions come through the chat area. There was one question about uh, different tools that might be good to do your uh, personality assessment. Um, okay. Heidi chimed in with DISC and MTBI, and then Lotus suggested Forte. Wonderful. Do you have I any heard others of... to suggest? Yeah, that's great. Um, DISC and Myers-Briggs MBTI are two of the popular ones. I haven't heard of Forte, so Lotus, you and I might need to talk offline about that. I'd be interested to hear more about that. Um, Strengths Finder is another very popular one. Uh, I think it's great for starting the conversation. Um, using Myers-Briggs, I think you have to be uh, careful and I, I won't get into the research about that, but you want to make sure that any assessment, any tool that you're using is sort of valid and reliable as a, as a scientific tool. And there's sort of different, different thoughts on, on Myers-Briggs. Um, there's one called the Strong assessment, S-T-R-O-N-G, which might even be an acronym, I'm not sure, but that is very common among people who are just trying to figure out what do I like to do? You know, what are my preferences? Like what, what sort of intrigues me? So less about personality, but more of if I could do anything, you know, what interests do I have that kind of help would help point me toward more meaningful work? So quite a slew of them out there. You just type personality assessment in Google and you can imagine what's going to show up. Just be careful about what you take. Um, the ones that tend to be um, free, low cost, or we'll say on Facebook 
aren't always going to be as helpful to you <laughs> as some of the other ones out there. If anybody wants to talk more about uh, personality assessments, I have plenty to, plenty to share and would be happy to connect with you offline. So great questions. Another obstacle from seeing professional networking as, as enjoyable and fruitful is I think we're given the tools to use, but not really told how to use them. A couple of examples, just briefly, and I'd love to talk more about this, but we'll keep it brief for purposes of this conversation. Number one, assessments. Speaking of assessments, you know, a lot of companies have us take them and then we're just checking off an HR box or a learning and development box. And by the way, I love HR and learning and development. That's very much a world I'm a part of. And I'm very um, intentional about surrounding myself by those HR and learning development, uh, talent development professionals that see value in the tools that they're using and are really using them to their fullest extent. So as you complete an assessment for work, great, a fantastic thing to do. How do you then use those results? There are a lot of companies that don't answer that question and they're just checking a box. Number two, I think for something like LinkedIn, your best, as far as I'm concerned, one of your very best um, resources and tools for professional networking, um, certainly virtually. So we have it at our disposal. There's so much we can do. And then we're not shown necessarily how to use it appropriately. So for example, the vast majority of connection requests that I receive on LinkedIn are not personalized. We sort of learn that when we hit the connect button, we are connected and we're good to go and we are building our network. And I think that is the greatest missed opportunity when it comes to LinkedIn is the personalized connection. I would argue that absolutely every connection request you make, you should personalize. You should give a bit of context. You know, Eric, I attended your event with Tech Ready Illinois, and I loved what you had to say, and I would love to be connected here on LinkedIn going forward. Fantastic. <laughs> That's less work for me to do to figure out, do I know this person? Should I know this person? Is this somebody that would benef be beneficial to connect with? Can I help them in some way? Um, you know, being mentioning that you read something that they wrote or that you liked a post that they put up, just some context is, is more helpful than none. So even though most of the requests I see receive aren't personalized, and I know what people are doing, they're hitting the connect button, assuming that I know who they are, or maybe they don't, then I will respond with, you know, thank you for the connection, I really appreciate it. Can you give me some context for why you wanted to connect with me personally? And a lot of people don't even respond to that question. And I just can't help but think that that is such a missed opportunity because I'm reaching out back out to them to say, basically, how can I help you? Or what do you need? Or what is it about our relationship specifically that you think would be beneficial? Um, to not respond to that, I think, is, is really sort of missing, missing an opportunity. I won't spend too much time on this. But if you do nothing else with LinkedIn, make sure you start with those personalized connection requests. Um, because that is, as far as I'm concerned, the beginning of a truly meaningful and potentially long-term relationship, professional relationship on LinkedIn and perhaps off of LinkedIn if you get to that point. All right. So that was about being given the tools and not being shown how to use them. <clears throat> Another obstacle in terms of uh, seeing professional networking as professional and or as, as enjoyable and fruitful is that quite often, especially when we're in the job search, we are so distracted by what's in the foreground, our immediate needs. So those trees in this picture that you're seeing are, represents the foreground. I need a job. Maybe I need a client. You know, I, I need a paycheck. Um, whatever it is that you need, those are the things that you can't help but see. As it turns out, the goal of professional networking isn't necessarily getting those needs met immediately. It is whatever is around that corner that you can't even see. And there have been so many conversations that I've gotten into and relationships that I've gotten into, and I had no idea where they were going to go. But I knew that wherever we ended up was going to be beneficial to one or both of us. But if I was so focused on, you know, when they say, well, Eric, tell me about yourself. Well, I need a job. You know, can you get me a job? Can you make an introduction? That, that is going to be such a turnoff. Um, that you may as well end the conversation there, quite honestly. <laughs> uh, most people will be understanding and they'll, they'll get what, where you're coming from. But if you change your pers perspective to think instead of about focusing on what your immediate needs are and what instead on what your long-term goal is, and that's 
a real meaningful long-term relationship with this person that you might not be able to quantify right off the bat. Now suddenly, as Lotus was saying earlier, we have that meaningful relationship that has become so much less transactional and superficial. Finally, you know, the fifth reason uh, or potential obstacle getting in the way of us seeing professional networking as enjoyable and fruitful is some of us are all too comfortable in the spotlight and the networking experience, the conversation doesn't become as fruitful as it can be because we are enjoying that spotlight and we are um, doing a lot of the talking. You know, we're so excited to share what we're passionate about. Um, Siri, Siri is trying to talk to me. Let's see if I can. <laughs> Sorry about that. You know what? I'm just going to take these out for now. Um, I don't want for much. Well, I apologize for this. Just a minute. I didn't expect. I didn't expect it to kick in. I think we should be okay. Um, and so if you're doing the talking and you're the one that's, you know, um, on the enthusiastic side of things, the, con the, the, the spotlight, we'll say, remains on you. On the other side of things, there are those of us who may or may not identify as being somewhat introverted that aren't as comfortable in the spotlight. And so we walk into a room or, you know, we jump on a Zoom call and we see our face there and we're not sure that we like that. We're not sure if we want to be there to begin with, much less that we want to be walking around in the spotlight. So one of the things that I like to say uh, during these sessions and just when I'm communicating with people about professional networking is if you're uncomfortable in the spotlight, point it elsewhere, especially for those of us who are um, more introverted. If we're on the more extroverted side, we're enjoying that spotlight, spotlight, use that to our advantage, you know, have it uh, allow us to be able to demonstrate um, our natural strengths, you know, maybe we're naturally sort of entertaining, we can tell a great story, we can engage people, all valuable things. But be aware of how long you spend in that spotlight. If we're introverted, and we're uncomfortable in the spotlight, remember that you can point it anywhere that you want. So what is a, um, what is a, a helpful way of, of redirecting that spotlight? Stephen Covey, who passed away a few years ago now said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And I love this, certainly, as someone who identifies as being more introverted. And I think we heard from Chris um, earlier, who said that, that he identified with being uh, an introvert himself and a, a good listener. If we first listen rather than speak, we get so much valuable information so that when it comes our time to serve that person, which should be our goal, not to be served, but to serve others, we have so much information to go by. So if we first seek to understand somebody else's headaches, somebody else's needs, um, somebody else's goals and objectives, when it comes time to help them, we can do so, so more effectively. Another way that my, my work is in Chicago, certainly not now, choirs aren't necessarily being encouraged, but I sing with two classical choirs. And during one rehearsal, our conductor was so frustrated with us and he stopped us and he kind of took a moment to gather him and always more loudly than you sing. I'm a sign here saying my connections unstable. So always, you should always listen more loudly than you sing. And at first, I thought that was um, that that was there was something off about that. And then when I thought about it, it made entire it made complete sense that if I was just showing up and I was singing and I didn't first have a sense of, well, what does the audience need? What do my fellow singers need from me? I was missing my greatest opportunity to be of service to show up and, and to give what was needed in that situation. So I think if we first seek to understand then to be understood, that will allow us to have some sense of context for a professional um, networking conversation. But it's not all about active listening. At some point, we need to respond to demonstrate that we've heard what's being said. And so we want to we want to ask people. We want to follow up and say, okay, well, d you know, tell me more about that. Now, like it seems like there's more of a story 
in here. I'd love to hear more about that. Like, tell me more about this passion of yours or give me a, a bigger, a better sense of this open position that you have and, and why it is so valuable to your organization and what you're looking for in the right candidate. Um, but going back to those trees that we saw in the foreground, it is so easy, I think, for us to be focused on our needs that we forget that number one, listening actively is an important, but two, that we should follow up with meaning, meaningful questions. An example of this is my wife and I went to visit friends of hers and these two friends in a very short amount of time adopted five children, which I think is just extraordinary. And one of the two fathers came to the door with, uh, when we arrived with the youngest at the time, his name was, is Derek, but at the time he was four years old. And Derek's, um, the, the father, one of the fathers said to Derek, uh, this is Katie, you remember Katie, right? And um, of course I was with her, but Derek smiled and he nodded and the, the dad just paused. And I thought, okay, something's gonna happen here. I'm not sure what it is. And uh, the father said, what can we ask Katie? I was impressed. And then Derek paused and he said, um, or the father had said, you remember that, that Katie teaches, right? That she's a teacher. And, and Derek said, yeah. And then Derek paused and said, what do you teach? And I, my jaw almost hit the ground because at four years old, Derek was being taught meaningful follow-up questions. And as adults, we have a difficult time with that because we're so excited about what we do and how we do it. And so enthusiastic about what we have to share and so focused on what our needs are that we missed the boat on asking meaningful follow-up questions. Yet Derek at four years old was asking my wife what she teaches. And he could have easily said, you know, well, you're a teacher, I'm in, I'm in school, you know, I have teachers, I do this and kind of taken that spotlight back on him, but he kept it on her and encouraged her to ask a question. Um, I just thought that was fantastic. You may be less impressed than I am, but, um, Let's see here. Hold on just a moment. I'm getting a request to start my video here. I had turned your video off. You were having a little um, vocal breakup. So gotcha. you go ahead and turn your video back on. All right. I see that. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry about this. Let me see if I'm going to be able to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to do it from my end. No, that's okay. Okay, I have started video again. Is it working? It is. Okay, perfect. Um, so listening actively, asking meaningful um, follow-up questions. We have about seven minutes left. Are there any, I have a few final slides that I want to make sure that I get through, but are there any additional questions at this point? There's nothing in Anything the chat else? yet, Eric. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so we'll we'll maybe have a couple of moments toward the end to to have a few being a few additional asked. I have put together a couple of tips Eric? on. Um, yes. I do have a question from Kelly. Sure. What are some examples of good follow up questions? <clears throat> Okay, well, that's a good question, Kelly. So there are, um, it, it would depend on what your, um, it would depend on what you're talking about and what your objective is, you know, what your discussion is. So we can network for all sorts of reasons. Um, but if our goal really is to serve somebody else and, and to really get to know them, you know, someone might say, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a, a couple of examples. Somebody say, for, for example, you know, I'm really excited to, to, to fill this position. You know, this is, this is a position we've had open for a little bit and I'm really excited to fill it. You could say, oh, well, that's great. You know, I'm actually looking for a job. Um, I might make a great candidate. These are the strengths that I would bring to your company. What you've done at that point is pulled the spotlight onto you. A good follow-up question would be, you know, so tell me more about that. Why, what is it about this position that, that you're, you're so excited about, you know, is, has this position been open for uh, a while? Um, is it newly open? Uh, how is this position going to, how do you see this position, this role contributing to the objectives of the organization? Um, have you yourself spent any time in this role? Like, do you have any firsthand experience with what this position entails? 
So that, those are all position specific questions. Um, I'm honestly somebody who, actually we're gonna get to this in a moment, but like I really wanna dig in, if, we're, if I'm just learning about you, I wanna know the why behind the things that you're telling me. So if we're talking and I'm just getting to know you, and you know like me say you you were just out on a road trip recently and you visited a couple of national parks which my wife and i just did and you're telling me this story you know i could take it at face value and say okay well that's just the way that he's killing time or i could say you know um do you have a particular interest in you know national parks is this something that you've done before um what is it about going on these hikes that you've told me about that you're really inspired by you know um does does this in some way help you gather your thoughts you know just just continuing the conversation in a way that's not transactional not superficial but demonstrates that you are genuinely interested in getting to know this person getting to know their headaches and their challenges um i would even add to this that i one of the the pieces of advice that i give to people who are in in job transition as they're sitting and interviewing um quite often we are the ones that are being asked the questions as the candidate um one of the greatest things that i think that you can do one of the most beneficial things that i think that you can do as a candidate is to leave that conversation being so clear on a challenge that your interviewer is facing not necessarily the organization but a headache or a challenge that you think the interviewer is facing meaningful follow-up questions help you sort of get to that challenge if you just kind of keep it superficial and you talk about the the um the benefits and the pay and the, the job description and the bullet points and some of that stuff that we often talk about you'll have a sense of what the position entails but our goal in establishing genuine rapport with anybody is to be seen as likable and trustworthy somebody that they want to develop a further relationship with, um, regardless of your qualifications at times. And so if you can walk away having a sense of what that person's challenge is, because you've been able to ask these meaningful follow-up questions, whether or not you get the job, you are armed with such valuable information going forward to stay in touch with them, to send them resources, to make connections and introductions that they haven't even asked for. Guess what happens along the way? They come to like you. <laughs> and they come to trust you. And these are things that very much work to our advantage. So I, I hope that's helpful, Kelly. It's a bit of a long-winded response, but. Um, all right, so let's tie this up if we can. I put together a, a PDF, a free PDF for, um, of my favorite networking tips, and you can find it at harmonyinsights.com slash network. It just may ask you to, uh, to subscribe to my newsletter. And if you're uncomfortable with that, I can just make sure that you get this, this PDF. But there are a couple of tips that I include on there for more effective networking. Number one, we want to avoid things being scripted. We said earlier that you want to have um, at least your value statement scripted so that you can improvise on it. But if you want to avoid scripted conversations that feel superficial, you want to avoid scripted questions. So we talked earlier about that very scripted question, um, what do you do? Instead of asking, what do you do? I love asking, why do you do what you do? The what part will come out in the response, but if you ask, what do you do? Someone will respond with, yeah, so as soon as you hear that, you know that whatever comes next, they've said a million times. Yeah, so I do this, I do that, and then you get into that sort of scripted value statement, perhaps, that sounds like marketing material. If instead you ask, why do you do what you do? You're going to get them to stop, maybe cock their head to the side. You know, they may even say, geez, you know what, I haven't been asked that question before. I guarantee whatever comes next is going to be so much more enjoyable and lead to a much more meaningful conversation and relationship than you would have had otherwise. So if you want to avoid scripted conversations, avoid scripted questions and ask something that might catch somebody off guard. And the asking why often results in, in much more interesting responses. Another tip that I have on this, this networking sheet is, you know, along the way I thought, how can I, how is it possible that I attend uh, the events that I'm responsible for, I'm very comfortable with, um, for some reason, you know, even as an introvert, I've gotten to a point where I can stand up in front of people. And if I'm responsible for the event, I'm comfortable. But when I attend an event that somebody else is running, I'm much less comfortable. 
I, I'm not sure if I want to participate or how, you know, and I, I kind of shy away from it. And I thought, well, it's kind of a mind hack. It's if I at least feel like I'm responsible for some portion of the event, I feel a little bit more confident. So no, I don't put on a bow tie and, and walk around with a plate of hors d'oeuvres at a at a face to face event or an in person event telling people I'm the host if I'm not. But if I show up and say, you know what, that person in the corner looks just as uncomfortable as I am, I'm going to make it my goal, my job to have them feel welcome and comforted and comfortable. Now suddenly it's easier for me. The spotlight is less on me. It's on somebody else. And I have a job. I have a role. And so just pretending that it's your job at any event, even virtually, to have people feel, make people feel comfortable and welcome um, can make you feel comfortable and welcome. This is going to have to be rhetorical for now because I know we are at the end of our time. But I would encourage you to consider, based on what we've discussed today, some of the, the tips and tricks that I've shared, um, personality style information, and, and just about everything else, how can you begin to connect more meaningfully? Yes, we're networking, but as Lotus said in the beginning of this conversation, it's all about meaningful connection. How can you get to a point where you are connecting more meaningfully with people based on how you show up, what you know of yourself, what you are learning about other people as you go, such that whatever your goal is, whatever your objective is, you get there. But instead of getting there through transactional, superficial conversation, you get there through meaningful interaction, you know, genuine rapport, and some of these things that ultimately not only make for good conversation and, and long-lasting relationships, but get us hired, which if we're looking for work, is, is ultimately what, what we're hoping to do. If you lead with that, I'm not sure it's going to work out so well. If you lead with focusing on being of service, wanting to serve others, learn about them as much as you can, um, be interesting, but also interested in who they are, you know, suddenly it just, it, it changes your perspective and the experience of professional networking becomes both enjoyable and fruitful. Um, at this point, Karen, if we have time, I'd love to take questions. I, people may need to leave and I know I've gone we over for are out of time. Minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, I do have one last slide. So if you can, um, relinquish the sh screen share. I am happy to. Thank you. Um, let me share one final screen with everyone. While you pull that up, I'll just say I, I remain available um, and accessible to answer any questions you have following this via email and, and to talk with you further if there's any additional insight that I can provide or any, anything you would like to talk through. Great. Um, I just went to the wrong place. Oh, it started from the beginning. There we go. All right. Um, so thank you for joining us today for this fantastic presentation. Thank you, Eric. I really enjoyed this and your insights. I learned a ton and I hope everyone <laughs> online has also learned something that they can apply to their job searches and managing their personal brand and their careers. So as a reminder, we'll be sending you a recording of today's webinar. Expect to see that in a couple days. We'll include an invitation to next week's webinar, which will be hosted by Marty Constant, and the topic will be career agility. Um, the week after that, we'll have a presentation from the University of Chicago on their data and analytics for business professionals program. And a couple weeks later, oop, just lost that. Um, a couple weeks later, we will have um, Curate Your Life with Gail Golden. Um, so if you're interested in any of those, um, please sign up. Um, we'll be um, advertising them on Eventbrite and we will be sending them out via the, the Tech Ready community. So thanks for attending. If there's anything else you'd like to see, you can email us at hello at techreadyillinois.com. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Bye everybody.